Hi, comedy family. Um, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about uh, satire, Roman satire. Uh, before we get into that, I have a couple of points of housekeeping that I want to get to. Uh, your final is uh, uh, going to be on the 18th from 1 to 3. I will be giving you more information about that um, in a week or so. Uh, but don't worry about your final right now. Just keep up with the material and keep reading. Um, second thing is that I am, uh, I, because, because I'm terrible at interneting, uh, I managed somehow uh, to upload half my uh, videos to the channel I set up for this class and the other half to a channel that was my kind of personal channel. Um, and uh, not that there's anything interesting on it, uh, but I uh, am um, migrating everything from the Penn's Odyssey account to the Professor Pletcher account. Okay, I email, I think I emailed you about this already. Um, uh, but I'm going to, uh, just to remind you, if you missed that email, um, all you got to do is go to YouTube and Google search for Professor Pletcher, and all the videos will be there. They'll have, the URLs are going to be different now. So whatever, <clears throat> you know, I sent you before, those links are all going to be dead. Um, but it, they won't be the they won't be hard to find. You just have to kind of Google search for Professor Pledger, and it'll be okay. <clears throat> and then the last thing I want to talk about before we get into satire itself is uh, to say that I want those of you who have not taken tragedy to take tragedy next semester. Classics thirty two twenty. C L A S three T ah C L A S three two two zero. Okay, um, some of you in this class in comedy have already taken tragedy, and some of you have not. Those of you who have not, please, please, please sign up. Because um, if you don't, the administration is going to cut the class, which will suck for me. And if you want things to suck for me, then don't take the class. My sad face. All right. So today we're going to talk about Roman satire. And there's a, a little shift here in the sense that, or a shift back, right? <clears throat> so we started with Archilochos and, and the, 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 the precursors to stage comedy, Archilochos and Homer, uh, the Battle of Mice and Frogs and Aesop were the four that I <clears throat> um, focused on in this class. And then we got into stage comedy, so it was Aristophanes and then Menander and then Plautus and Terence. So we're moving back off the stage now uh, to forms of comic expression that are uh, were not staged. And so in this respect, uh, we're still dealing with uh, what we, we're still in the realm of what the Greeks, although we're dealing with Roman literature tonight, but what the Greek word, of course, is iskrologia, which is uh, saying bad words, is more or less what it means. Uh, shameful speech, if we want to use the more uh, accepted scholarly term, but it pretty much means saying bad words. Um, and it moves off stage um, over time. Uh, and the Romans never really fully developed a comic language, well, at least not in what survived. Uh, under the empire, I should say. Uh, Uh, yeah, stage comedy, you're right. Okay, so it was basically remakes of old, uh, either Terence or Plautus or other Republican-era comp comedians or Menander or, you know, 
uh, or <laughs> well, it'll change over time. But in any case, uh, the uh, what comes to the forefront by the time we hit Horace's day is that comedic expression kind of moves to the 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 written the written word, the printed word. That's a an anachronism because there's no printing yet as such, but. Uh, definitely the written word. Um, it's still performed um, in the sense that they're given in uh, public readings um, and, uh, you know, uh, because uh, texts are expensive. So if you want to hear the most recent work by your favorite author, you'd have to go at a certain, like, you'd have to be like going to a concert or a show nowadays. Like, you'd have to know who was reading it at what time, at what place, and you'd have to go to it and hear it. Um, or you'd just have to be walking by and say, hey, I'd like to hear that, and, and just stroll in. Um, uh, so, but it's not, it's not a play as such. And you know this, if you've read Horace and Juvenal, these are, these are poems, right? Um, some of them narrative, some of them non-narrative, some of them discursive, some of them didactic. Uh, they're, so they all, they take different forms, but they're all, they're, they're still performative in one sense or another. Though, well, we'll get into the performative context of, of Horace and Juvenal in just a second. Um, but before that, let's just talk about the genre of satire as opposed to the drama or the genre of uh, performed uh, drama of staged comedy. Uh, it's a different genre with different expectations. Um, and uh, so this brings us down to the meaning of the word satire for a long time. <clears throat> The meaning of the word satire was all right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, in Latin, the word we're talking about is the word satura. Or actually, technically, satira. which is derived from the Latin word satura. So the word satira for a long time was thought to derive from the Greek satire. So the problem with that is that, uh, um, well, okay, before I get the problem with that. Uh, so it seems like a logical connection, right? Satira to satura. Uh, Because the, the the satyr plays in Greek dramatic tradition feature drunken um, illicit activities, uh, but the word is more nowadays more commonly linked to the Latin satura, which means stuffed, as in like. To be satisfied. To be filled up. All right. So you see the sat in satura, that's like sated, satiated, satisfied when you're done with something, when you've had enough of something, then you're satura. So you're stuffed or you're filled with something. So this brings me to the next point that I want to make. Uh, and I told you, I promised you I was going to come back to this a few lectures ago, but it's the food aspect of comedy. Uh, now, one, one of these things that we've talked about, not we, I have talked about to you, uh, uh, is, uh, the, uh, is uh, 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 the cook, the stock figure of the cook. Um, um, but there's a lot of food imagery that goes on throughout comedy. So when you think about the kind of food that is stuffed or filled, uh, what you think of 
uh, or at least what I think of. I mean, think about a food. No, no, don't think about eating the food. Don't think about what you like to eat or when you get full or anything like that. Just think about a kind of food that is so stuffed together that you can't pass, possibly pack anything more into it. What do you think of? Well, what I think of is a sausage. Because a sausage has a packing case, come back to that in just a second, uh, that is uh, stuffed full, right? And has to be in this, you know, and then you cook it or you slice it. Depends on what you're, I, I make a killer sausage, trust me. I'm, uh, I make a great sausage. Um, uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, so you think about that. So there's a, there's that stuffed and filled imagery, right? And so when you think about like the the comedies of of Aristophanes, it's just bursting all over the place, right? It, like these weird tangents, things that have nothing to do with any other thing that happens in the plot. Plots change halfway through. Um, I mean, it, it, it tempers down, of course, uh, in Roman comedy. Plautus less so, Terence more so. Um, but the idea, the point I'm getting at here with, with, with comedy and the, and the, uh, the satura, uh, satire, is to say that um, what goes into comedy is everything. There's nothing that isn't, uh, um, there's nothing that is off limits. Uh, you can stuff all of it into one casing. Um, and to get back to the sausage metaphor for just a moment, uh, so I would, I'm, I mean, the best explanation of this that I know uh, comes from my grandmother, uh, my late grandmother, uh, who uh, used to, when she was making sausage, would always say uh, to all the uh, grandkids at her elbow, uh, you know what goes into sausage? And we would all say, what, Grandma? And she would say, uh, elbows and assholes. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of true. Because what goes into sausage are all the otherwise unedible parts of uh, of the pig or the uh, uh, or the cow or the lamb. Uh, they all get kind of thrown into a blender and stuffed into uh, the intestines of a pig and wrapped up and pinched off. Right. Sorry if you like sausage. I hope I haven't ruined your appetite. I personally love sausage, and I'm not going to stop loving sausage even though I know what I know about it, but, you know, hey. Um, so this is, this is uh, uh, um, the, 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 the kind of, this is the, the transition point between what we were talking about, stage comedy, and what we're dealing with, with this new kind of written comedy that we're dealing with. It's not new, but not for us anyway. Uh, this um, uh, shift in modes from what is presented on the stage to what is presented on the page. The Romans were very proud of their satire. Um, they uh, said, that, well, there's a very famous quote uh, from a uh, later Roman uh, uh, literary critic by the name of Quintilian, and he said, Satura quidem tot tota nostra est. Satura quidem tota nostra est. Well, at least satire is all ours. And what he meant by that was like, yeah, we borrowed tragedy. Yeah, we borrowed comedy. Yeah, we borrowed history. Yeah, we got all that stuff from the Greeks. But at least... Satire is ours, our own.
Okay, sort of. Uh, I'm not going to go down a list of all the names here. Um, in fact, this is going to end up being a rather short lecture, I think. Uh, I know I always say that and then um, keep talking. Um, Yeah, you don't need to know any of that. Well, you do need to know it, but like, you know, not for the purposes of this class. Um, okay, so let's let's do Horace first. Uh, so let's talk a minute about Horace. Horace is, um, Horace is an interesting figure um, uh, in a way. Um, Horace's dad was a slave, uh, and I said that I would talk a little bit about the practice of slavery in the Roman Empire, and so I guess this is the time to do it now. Um, normally, uh, uh, or not normally, I shouldn't say, but frequently what would happen was, uh, if you had an able-bodied slave, uh, you would set him up in a business. And what I mean by that is you'd give him like a storefront or a like a food cart or like a, you know, food truck, I guess is the modern equivalent to it, you know, uh, dishing out dirty water dogs or whatever. And, uh, and whatever he earned, you know, sort of two thirds of it would go to the master and one thirds of it one third of it would go, the slave could keep. And eventually over time, uh, the slave could save up and uh, pay for their own freedom. Which was a good, I mean, I was going to say it was a good system. And then I suddenly realized I was talking about slavery. So no, not a good system. Uh, but it was a, an efficient system for the Roman economy. Um, in that it 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 kind of did two things at once. At once it kept uh, labor force under control of management, and at the same time it kept capital in circulation. So if you were a guy, if you were the pater, the head of the household, and you could afford a slave, and you bought the slave, and you set the slave up in business, and you had a farm, or had a business or whatever, and your business went bust, uh, but your slave's business didn't go bust, you could then sell the slave and get your losses, your losses back uh, on it. So it kept capital in circulation, it kept money in circulation. Um, uh, and I forget the second point I was going to talk about here. Um, Oh, but it also meant that, like, if you if you were purchased as a slave, uh, that you had the opportunity to earn your own freedom, uh, in in some instances. And Horace's dad did, um, from the accounts that I have read. And again, caution on reading uh, these ancient biographical accounts, but. Uh, uh, in the accounts that I have read, uh, Horace's dad was a, I can't remember the exact Latin title, uh, something, Quaestoris, Quaestor, uh, he was basically, a, he basically was a, he was basically running a money lending business um, and making money off the interest. Uh, uh, yeah, and he made enough money to buy his own freedom, so he became a freedman, and so Horace, Himself was not born into slavery. Uh, Horace, uh, his dad was, uh, again, from the ancient accounts, his dad was very obsessive over Horace's education, wanted to make sure that he had the, the, the best of the best, which allowed Horace to rub elbows with uh, the high and mighty uh, sooner or later. And... Uh, uh, yeah, 
Okay, so um, I, yeah, all right. If you want to read about more, more of Horace's, uh, more of Horace's biography, you can look it up. It's not really what we're talking about here today. Um, but the upshot of this is Horace uh, became friends. Uh, with a dude called Mycenas who was extremely well connected and when I say extremely well connected I mean he was at the right hand of the Emperor Augustus he was in fact Horace's patron Which is to say he stumped up the funds for Horace to write his poetry. Horace was not Mycenas's only, uh, so, okay. So you have the patron and you have the client. Patron-client relationship uh, where the patron gives the money, the room and board, um, the funds for the client who is an artist to produce their art, but the patron owns the art at the end of the day. My, how the art world has changed over time. Um, both Horace and Juvenal will uh, delve into this patron client dynamic in their satires. Um, obviously, not in the same way. So Horace becomes uh, part of the, 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 the Mycenas' inner circle. This includes other poets uh, that would have included people like Virgil, heard of him, um, and uh, uh, probably Ovid, though Ovid is a little bit younger, uh, but probably he rubbed shoulders with Ovid. Um, and any sculptor, poet, painter, of the of his contemporary time uh, he would have been well connected with and this comes out in the satires so let's talk a little bit here about juvenile or juvenile sorry getting ahead of myself Horace's actual satires um, I'm not gonna go through them point by point as you know uh, yes right you've heard me say it a million times oh I didn't give you Horace's dates uh, 65 BCE to 8 BCE more or less the same as Virgil. But yeah, 65 BCE to 8 BCE. So Horace, by all accounts, was on the Republican side, which means he sided with Mark Anthony. Whereas, uh, you know, versus the factions that sided with Julius Caesar. Well, we know... Caesar side won over Mark Anthony, but then Caesar was assassinated. Uh, but by that point, it was pretty clear that Rome was uh, headed towards a uh, um, an empire, an emperorship. So Horace jumped ship uh, and and got on board with Augustus in Mycenaeus. Money talks. And bullshit walks. So what did I assign you? 1, 2, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 10, 2, 5, and 2, 6. Um, I'm just going to run through these uh, uh, quickly. Uh, 1, 2. Um, Turn this other lamp on. The lighting's going to get screwy here. Way screwy.
This is what happens when you record at dusk. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Uh, so one, two, uh, um, I mean, there's some fascinating things. So like one, like one of the funny things about satire, the uh, satire 1.2 is, um, uh, or book one, satire two, or satire book one, two, or uh, actually now I don't even know how to properly refer to it, um, is that a lot of, a large portion of the satire is taken up towards, uh, uh, Horace is giving advice about uh, uh, how you can get away with having illicit sexual affairs. Uh, and uh, he runs through all the possibilities. Well, you can do it with a, you know, a senator's wife, but, you know, you really, you don't want to do that because that could get you into hot water later on down the road. Or you could do it with some poor woman, but you don't really want to do that because if she gets pregnant, comes back, and then... You know, then you're in hot water. And da, da, da. so, at the end of the day, his advice is that if you really, if if you're a, you know, if you need to have, if you, all right, this is comedy, so I'm allowed to use sh shameful speech. But if you want to get your rocks off, uh, the best way to do it is to do it with a freed's a freedman's wife. Which is weird because that would have been what his mom was. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's his, yeah, that's his uh, special uh, advice. Uh, I mean, but this is a theme that runs throughout Roman poet or, or Roman erotic poetry of this time, including Ovid, um, about, you know, visiting brothels and how to get yourself in and out of affairs and uh because they're the uh, well okay um mm. one four satire one four is horace's um basically it's horace trying to put himself in the tradition of satire Right, so he makes reference to this writer called Lucilius, who was a writer from the prior century, a Roman writer from the prior century, uh, whose poems don't survive for us today in anything other than quotation, um, and uh, are the only thing we know about Lucilius is that uh, it comes from from Horace, who is obviously a biased source because he clearly. Uh, sees Lucilius as some kind of rival, even though he's been dead for a hundred years, but, you know, hey, artists, bear grudges. Um, what he says about Lucilius is that he actually says he's a muddy river. When Horace calls Lucilius a muddy river, what he, what, what he means is that, or what he's alluding to is what his contemporary Roman audience would know uh, as uh, from the Tiber River at the time, uh, which would have been a muddy river, um, but uh, that's not really doing it justice. It was more than a muddy river. It was the place where uh, all the sewage drains emptied into, so muddy. Uh, and uh, also a place where where uh, dead bodies who whose families could not afford to bury them or who otherwise were meant to be made to disappear would be thrown in. So um, yeah, muddy muddy river. Um, but when the when Horace uses this metaphor. Lucilius is a muddy river. What he means is that Lucilius didn't edit his writing well enough. He left too much in. You know, he rambled too much. He's not neat and clean enough. And Horace himself, well, to Horace's credit, he's a very neat poet, a very clean poet. And when I say that, I don't mean that by in terms of content. 
I mean that in terms of his uh, literary style. He's more like Terence than he is Plautus. Um, yeah. What else did I want to talk about here? Okay, one five, book one, uh, satire five in Horace, is uh, uh, what we call a travelogue, which is to say uh, it's an account of a journey that Horace is recounting in first person voice uh, that he takes with his BFFs, Virgil and Mycenas. Uh, uh, a <laughs> there, and so here we get back into the, the, the or this is as kind of as close as we come to in Virgil to Iscrologia, shameful speech, right? So Iscrologia means saying things that are shameful, basically means saying bad words, uh, you know, saying words that might get you bleeped, um. <laughs> But uh, in in one satire one point five, uh, 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 the the closest we come to Iscrologia in Horace is uh, uh, his account of his uh, he got stood up by s some young woman that he met along the way. He was supposed to come meet him in his room, and then he had to you know rub one out, whatever. But then they all go off and continue on their journey. So here's the thing about Satire 1.5, right? So you read this and it, it reads like this kind of like, um, uh, kind of like jaunty sort of lads about town, kind of just taking this road, like sort of road trippy sort of narrative uh, with Mycenas and Horace and Virgil. And, but like, what Horace doesn't tell you is that where they're going is from Rome to another place where Mycenas is supposed to have a conference with delegates from Mark Anthony's camp to negotiate some kind of peace between, he's still Octavian at this stage, but who will be Augustus and Mark Anthony. He just totally leaves it out because one doesn't talk about business. One doesn't discuss affairs. So you get this, you get the, and this is a thing that I, well, okay, never mind. I won't go down that road. I was going to talk about personal experience, but no, you guys aren't interested. Uh, Lucilius appears again in Satire 110. Uh, satire should only be in Latin, he says. Uh, and Horace goes on to say that while Lucilius invented satire, he perfected it. Of course he did. Uh, satire 2.5 in Horace is the uh, parody uh, of the underworld scene um, from the Odyssey. Uh, which we discussed already when we talked about the Odyssey. Um, but it's the discussion between Tiresias and Odysseus. And there's some funny things that happen in it. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, for our purposes is when um, Tiresias advises Odysseus that the safest way through life is that if you play the character of the parasite, or you should be like Dallas. You should be the scheming slave. Don't try to be the master. Just be the scheming slave, and then your life will be happier. right? And I, I mean, that's kind of interesting in the sense that it gives you a, a larger perspective on uh, the comic outlook of life. You know, if you're in charge you're more likely to be the victim of tragedy. If you're not in charge, the worst you can encounter is comedy. Uh, and that's, I mean, I know that's not true in real life terms. I know, please. Uh, but 
like in in the in the kind of like context of of uh, European literature, that's the way it's sort of framed, uh, and it really is. It really is until I mean it will change. It changes as we get down into the eighteenth, nineteenth. Well, not in the eighteenth so much, but nineteenth, twentieth, twenty first century, where people begin to realize that like you know. Uh, poor people's lives also involve suffering. Um, it's not just uh, kings and queens, but and, and in any case, sorry, didn't mean to go down that particular road, but I did, so too bad. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see what else, 2 6. Well, 2 6, I mean, uh, uh, Horace's satire, uh, book two. Horace's, Horace's Satires, Book Two, Satire Six, uh, deals with the city mouse and the country mouse, and we've already come across that uh, when we looked at Aesop's Fables. So you can see how that has a continuity, um, and it certainly doesn't end there. I mean, we still make jokes about city people in country places and country people in city places, and I mean, I'm not saying that. It's not funny. It just depends on how well it's written. All right. That's all I have to say about Horace. Let's move on to Juvenal. Juvenal was fascinating. We don't really know nearly as much as Juvenal as, as we know about Horace. Which would seem to indicate, or would seem to imply at any rate, though again, just my theory, that Juvenal did not have the same contacts uh, amongst the patrician class that Horace did. Or perhaps he did, and just wanted them just wanted to keep them secret. That's another possibility. Fact is, we don't really know much about Juvenal. It's very, it's difficult to date Juvenal uh, in terms of his birth and his death. There are some internal clues about, that, that tell us uh, in the time frame in which his works were written, we have references to certain figures and to certain events that we know from other sources that happened at a specific date. So we can, we know that it can't have been written before this year or that year. And so when we talk about juvenile, we're talking about a date of, of some time around 100 CE. So he's writing about Roughly 100, 110, well, Horace's satires were probably written in 120, or 120, sorry, let me start over. Horace's satires are probably written sometime around between 30 and 20 BCE, okay? Then he moved on to other modes, other forms of poetry, uh, as he moved closer and closer into nearer to Augustus and Augustus' circle. Uh, supposedly Augustus actually specifically asked Horace to write him a letter because uh, letter writing used to be a thing um, and they were done in verse and poetry um, so now you know why I hate email so much um, but uh, uh, ver uh, Juvenal was about a century roughly a century maybe a bit more century plus maybe 110 120 years uh, after uh, Horace, so he flourishes around one, sometime between 100 and, and 120, 130, somewhere in that range. But it's very, it's hard to give a, it's very difficult to give us a, a, a specific date, just as it is very difficult to give assign a, a specific historical personage to juvenile, which is a good thing, because the. The primary feature, I would argue, 
as others before me have argued, is that one of the one of the foundational features of juveniles satires is that this is a persona. So what does that mean that this is a persona? Well, persona in Latin means the same as the Greek word, which I gave to you earlier in the semester. So I'm not going to define it for you now. Just kidding. As the Greek word character, right? Not to be confused with our English word character, okay? Our English word character derives from the Greek word character. But these two words both have specific meanings. They mean masks. It means the mask that an actor puts on when he, always a he, takes his role on stage. So there is, because we know so little about juvenile from a kind of historical perspective, uh, there is some discussion about um, um, how do we take these poems? Because they're so full of invective. Put that down. I'll put it down right here, right underneath Iscrologia, because it's not that far away from it thematically, but invective, accusatory speech, abusive speech. So Iscrologia generally covers, you know, you know, the wide umbrella of anything that you can't say in, in public. Um, um, uh, whereas invective means you're going right at a certain person or a certain topic, right? So Juvenal's poetry is filled with a kind of invective, though it's invective Roman style, which means that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, um, name contemporary names uh, because, um, probably because, it's the Roman Empire, and if you name specific names, you know, you might not be heard from again. So in Juvenal's famous phrase at the end of uh, Satire 1, he says, uh, I will just, I will, I'm only going to criticize, uh, he says, those famous people who lay along the Flaminian Way, whose graves are along the Flaminian Way. Well, that's where all the graves of the, you know, famous senators from, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago are buried. Right, well, you're not really taking any risks if you make fun of them because no one knows or cares anymore. You know, why don't you make fun of the emperor now? But no, that's not on the cards. Um, though, yeah, although I, I, I tend to think that Juvenal lived under a, a more... Uh, liberally express, expressive uh, environment when Horace did. Uh, but that's just my feeling. I mean, I could be wrong about that. Um, so, what else does Juvenal talk about? He complains a lot about the city of Rome. Uh, it, um, <laughs> what does Juvenal find to complain about the city of Rome? Let me see. Wait, let me think about... First, let me think about the ways, the things that I would complain about the city of New York. There's too many people. Number one, it's too crowded. Uh... Can't get through the streets. Can't get to the marketplace anymore. Um, it's noisy. It's way too noisy. Uh, 
noise all the time, too much traffic. Um, and, well, okay, so here, like, so in this context, let me just say, yeah, I mean, I don't, this is not a, a complaint complaint per se, but I mean, I hear sirens constantly these days. Um, and I understand why that is, and that's okay. Um, but even when times are normal, are normal, were, were normal, will be normal, I hope. It was noisy too. Horns going off. I mean, like six in the morning, people blowing their horns, like, ah, all the time. Noise, noise, all the time, right? That's another thing that Juvenal complains about. Now, here's the thing about ancient Rome. It's different. In ancient Rome, it was, uh, the city was pedestrian only during the day which meant that all the goods, food, uh, wine, supplies, olive oil, you name it, all that stuff had to be brought in by horse or donkey drawn carriages overnight over cobblestone streets hauled by not just the animals that I mentioned, but they were dragging uh, carts that had wooden wheels, but wooden wheels that were rimmed in iron. So <laughs> uh, you can imagine what that might have sounded like at night. So it might have it, it might have been bad. Uh, and then Juvenal complains about all the other things that go on that he finds a complaint about in city life, um, like uh, 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 fire, the constant threat of fire uh, that, that hangs over Rome all the time, and and how uh, people will burn down their own houses in order to get the insurance money. Geez, I mean, totally not relatable to modern day circumstances. Um, <laughs> But all of this is done through a persona, right? All of this is voiced through, not, like this is so, all of this satire takes place in, uh, satire one, two, takes place in the voice of his friend, Umbricius. Oh, you can find it in the text if you missed it. Umbri oh, this is an M, not an N. Sorry, does that look better? Umbricius, right? Which is a funny name for a friend because there's two associations with it. One is, one is a geographical association, which is Umbria, which is a, a territory outside of Rome. So people speculate that maybe Juvenal was from Umbria original, originally, and this is a nod to his uh, uh, birthplace, and it's possible. But to me, the other suggestion is Umbra. And Umbra is a shade, right? As in, like, your word umbrella or umbrella. Right? What does an umbrella do? Yeah, I know we associate it with keeping the rain out, but... The umbrella provides shade for your for your head. So Umbricius is like Mr. Shady, like you know, in the shade, in the shadows. Uh, uh, but it's a persona, right? It's a mask that, arguably, and, and some scholars have argued that this is a mask. And I I like this argument. Um, I'm not saying it's absolutely correct, but I do like this argument but that this is a mask that Juvenal was putting on uh, to uh, you know, voice his shameful speech. Um, but at the end of the day, in satire 1-2, uh, 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 one, 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 
or sorry, one three. I, I mean to say, I keep saying one two. I meant to say one three. Um, is um, <laughs> I, I don't know. The, I mean, the thing that sticks with me the longest is uh, at the end, like you know. So all these things were all realm. You know, it's too crowded. It's too noisy. You know. Uh, uh, pay, right, right. The, the 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 you know, there's too many fires. Uh, but the worst thing of all is that there are too damn many foreigners in the city. There's too too many Greeks. They took our jobs. <laughs> there's too many foreigners in the city, right? And so this satire contains. I'm going to paraphrase it here, but this is juveniles. I, I mean, it's funny as hell. I mean, look, I'm going to come back here to the idea of persona. Now, let's remember, this is comedy, okay? This is performative. It's supposed to be funny, okay? It's not, it, it, it's, it's supposed to be a joke. So, what Juvenal says about the Greeks is that, like, you can't trust, you don't, hey, look, be careful. Be careful if you invite a Greek to dinner. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to leave them alone with your daughter. Because, you know, you'll make moves. And, uh, you know, for that matter, you don't want to leave them alone with your son. Because, you know, you'll probably make moves. And for that matter, you probably shouldn't leave them alone with grandma either. <laughs> but this goes, like, this is, this is, it, it's funny. I mean, it's, ra like, racist. Yes, it's racist. Uh, by, yes, it's a racist joke. Uh, and it. But it also tells us about Ro Roman social, the 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 kind of Roman uh, mental construct of how they saw the other people around them, uh, in the sense that they saw Greek, like like they had a funny relationship with Greek culture, vis-a-vis -vis Roman culture. And this goes back to what I was saying about Quintilian earlier in the lecture when he made that very proud humble brag, you know, at least that quite sort of, sorry, very proud, humble brag. That makes no sense. But sort of, sort of proud, humble brag. Does that make more sense? Uh, at least satire is our own. At least satire belongs to Rome. At least, well, he was wrong. Uh, satire had already been invented by a Greek author by the name of Nippus, one of the names I left out earlier. But again, I'm not going to bog you down in all the details right uh, at this stage or at any stage for that matter uh, but there's a there's this funny kind of psychology that the Romans had with Greek culture and that uh, they they knew that m most of their modes of expression were modeled on Greek precursors But at the same time, they also knew that they had conquered Greece and it was under their control. So there's a kind of a, a sort of a imbalance here in that, well, we own them, like we own their land. But at the same time, everything that we've accomplished culturally is due to them. So how does this get balanced? It gets balanced in the sense that, that the old, those old Greeks are okay. Your Sophocles, your Homer, your 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 uh, your Plato, you know, th those are okay Greeks. They're they're fine. But these Greeks that are in the city now, no, no, they're not. They don't belong here. They, they, you know, they're taking our jobs, and that's the that's the kind of 
idea that Juvenal was picking up on. Now, I'm doing Juvenal a bit of a, a dirty here. Uh, he certainly, uh, uh, oh, I didn't cover uh, Satire 10, which was the other one I assigned. Um, this is uh, this was adopted uh, later uh, by uh, Samuel, excuse me, Samuel Johnson uh, into English. Uh, it's into a poem called The Vanity of Human Wishes. And it's a pretty, pretty, it's almost a trip. It's base. it's more or less a translation. It's not exactly a translation, but it's, you know, he's adhering pretty closely to Juvenal's model. So I'm, I'll just refer to Juvenal Satire 110 as the vanity of human wishes, where he goes through, where Juvenal runs through all of the different things that people desire. Do you want beauty? Beauty fades. Do you want... Uh, uh, political power, while well, political power might end up in your assassination. Do you want wealth? Well, wealth doesn't really buy happiness. You know, he goes, he goes down and down and down the list. Um, and at the end, he concludes that the best thing that, that you can wish for in life is... Okay, get ready to do some etymological work. Mens. Mens sana incorpore sano. So mens is uh, the root of the English word mental. So mind. Sana. You can probably guess what that means. So a sane mind in means in Latin, what it mean, means in English. Corpore, as in like corpse, your body, corporal, sano. So a sound mind, a sane mind, a sound mind, a healthy mind in a healthy body. That's Juvenal's conclusion about what we can hope for. Juvenal's full of these quotes, right? It's Juvenal who tells us that all the people want, all it takes, all it takes to uh, control the population is panis et kerkenses. Sorry. Panis et kerkenses. I almost ran out. I had to cram it all at the end of the page because I suck at writing. Panis et kerkenses. Bread and circuses is what that means. You want to steal the population? You're a ruler, you're in charge, all you got to do is give them food and entertainment. And they'll be, they'll do whatever you want them to do after that. Of course, we know now that's certainly not true. And then my favorite one. My singular favorite quote from Juvenal Quis custodiet ipsos custodes? Quis custodiet ipsos custodes?
and it's it comes in one of Juvenal's broader discussions of uh, the social organization of Rome uh, and the political organization of Rome, and what it means is who who is going to police the police. Traditionally, it's translated as who will guard the guardians or who will watch the watchers, but it may basically means who who is going to police the police. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, juvenile, like, so there's a, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I could be wrong about this. Again, you're not, you're never... Um, uh, you're never obligated to uh, um, agree. I, I mean, what I tell you in these lectures are not, uh, I don't, I'm not presenting these things to you as absolute truth. I'm presenting these things to you as somebody or as, as ideas that I have thought about. Um, but uh, if you, have different ideas about them and can demonstrate their validity. Uh, that's a good thing. And that's uh, kind of what I want. Uh, but when I look at Horace and Juvenal, although they're both writing satires and, and like, if you, if you look at the, just like, if you look at the printed text and I'm going to, I'll just ask you to do this. Just if you're like, when you so when you open your course packs, and you and you look at the translations uh, of Horace and Juvenal, you will note that very frequently in Juvenal you will see this in the text. You will see this printed in the text between words, just a straight line. Just the simple straight line that comes straight down. What this is is a is a it's a typographical indication of uh, in poetry what we call caesura. You will notice that in Horace, the printed text of Homer, there or not Homer, forgive me, Homer. Uh, in Horace, there are none, none, or almost none of these marks, of these single, so you'll see a word here, and then you'll see a word on the other side. So they'll be, you'll be running on. So blah, 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 and then you'll get this, and then you'll be blah, 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 after that. Okay, so what that what that type typographical uh, symbol indicates is this idea of caesura. What is caesura? Caesura indicates where there is a break in the uh, normal rhythmic pattern of the poem. Okay, so so. Both Horace and Juvenal are writing in hexameter, right? So hexameter is uh, long, short, short, long, short, short, with variations, whatever. I'm not going to get into all that. But there are rules that govern the way that that rhythm runs. Uh, and when it's violated, that's where you see this, this line in the text, right? So you see it all the time in Juvenal. Like there's like just if you go back and look through the the, the text of Juvenal, you'll see it. If not on every page, at least every other page, you'll see the straight line come right down between words, right? Because that indicates where, hey, the rhythm skipped, the needle skipped at this point, uh, and that's actually, actually a good way to think of Sejour. It's like a needle skip. In the in the in the in the in the record, you never see it in Horace, uh, but you see it quite often in Juvenal. 
which to me, I mean, like, there's two ways to interpret that. There's the idea that that means that, like, Horace was a better poet than Juvenal was, because he doesn't do Sejora. Um, and that's kind of the way uh, people generally over the, not, when I say generally, I'm not talking like the last 30 years, I'm talking like the last 2,000 years, is that Horace is a better poet because his, you know, everything is neater and all that stuff. Um, but I think that this is a thing that Juvenal does on purpose. Why do I think that? Let me come back here to this, the persona. What is Juvenal's persona? What is the mask that he's putting on? What is the, what is the, the poetic character that he's trying to portray? It's somebody who's pissed. He doesn't like the way things are in Rome. Uh, he's had enough, and he's not taking any more of it. Or at least his friend Imbricius has had enough, and he's not taking any more of it. Uh, so the sejura is like, you know, you could be talking, talking. Talk, I'm like, look, I went to the grocery store, and you know, I, <sighs> there was this, that sejura, right, where you can't, finish the thought where you, you start something and you you have to break it off because you're 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 just right there so i don't think the sejura in 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 juvenile is i, I would argue is not a, a um, an indication of uh an inferiority of the mastery of the language necessarily although like you know horace was extremely well-educated and very polished and was writing for an upper-class audience. And it's a little more difficult to figure out what audience Juvenal was writing for because we know nothing about him. Uh, but uh, to me, when I just read the, the, the poems, it's Juvenal's sort of like, like trying, like not Juvenal, but like the persona that he's trying to put onto the page is this sort of like, you know, invective uh, where's my I, well, I already put it up i'm not going to put it up oh here it is invective like this is the invective part of his persona right? he's just going to go down everything that's wrong but again he says like i'm not gonna I, you know i'm just gonna uh, i'm not gonna get after the people around me now i'm just gonna go after the people who are already dead so there's a distancing, but also, a, you know, a, a sense of invective. So satire is, uh, yes, so that's all I have to say about satire. Um, in Roman literature, uh, it, I, I should say, um, there's always a tightrope to walk. Uh, this is not 5th century Athens, um, or indeed uh, 21st century America where you can uh, go on stage and say what you like about the people in power. Wasn't like that in ancient Rome. Uh, so things had to be, uh, I won't say encoded necessarily. I would just say uh, that poets were aware that they needed to maintain a degree of uh, plausible deniability how about that okay um yes so great i'll see you all soon i have to now go microwave myself some dinner um i love you all i miss you all also i just want to say i don't think i i mean i'm this isn't by no in by no means official I haven't heard this officially, but I just I just think that all your classes are going to be online next semester. Um, and I hope, well, not I hope, 
I know that I will be more efficient at online teaching next semester, so please sign up for tragedy. Okay? Thank you.